go into the Word. Let's open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 7, verse 5 and 6. Vamos a abrir nuestra Biblia, amados hermanos, a Romanos capítulo 7, versículo 5 y 6. Aleluya. Vamos a estar meditando en la palabra en esta tarde, allí en esa porción, en Romanos 7, 5 y 6. Que sea Dios ministrando a cada uno de nuestra vida en esta preciosa tarde, hermano, como Él ha estado haciendo. May the Lord be ministering to our lives, brethren, in the Word, in this precious afternoon, as He has already been doing. Praise be the name of Jesus. So that's Romans chapter 7, verse 5 and 6. Eso es Romanos capítulo 7, versículo 5 al 6. Ya esto lo tenemos en el proyector, we have it up on the screen. Let's um, be standing in reverence to the Word. Vamos a ponerlo de pie en reverencia a la Palabra. Y lo vamos a leer en el nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. We're going to read in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. And the scripture says to us, brethren, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. I'm going to read in Spanish as well. Lo voy a leer en español. La palabra de Dios dice, Porque mientras estábamos en la carne, las pasiones pecaminosas que eran por la ley obraban en nuestros miembros, llevando fruto para muerte. Pero ahora estamos libres de la ley por haber muerto para aquella en que estábamos sujetos, de modo que sirvamos bajo el régimen nuevo del Espíritu y no bajo el régimen viejo de la letra. Aleluya. This precious afternoon we're going to be looking at a message, brethren, that is titled The Flesh and the Spirit. Glory to the name of Jesus. The flesh is one thing and the spirit is another thing. Glory to the Lord. Vamos a ver este título en esta preciosa tarde, amados hermanos. De esta palabra, de esta porción que el Señor me ha dado para, para nuestra vida. Bendito sea el Señor, que se titula, es la carne y el espíritu. Bendito sea el Señor. ¿Verdad? Las dos cosas son cosas separadas. Bendito sea el Rey. La carne es carne y el espíritu es espíritu. Bendito sea el Señor para siempre. When the word of God, beloved brethren, speaks to us as we have read here. We have the Apostle Paul directed by the Holy Spirit to write this letter unto the church to the Romans. There was a church once called the letter to the Romans. There was a Roman church, like there was a people of a, uh, a congregation that believes in Jesus Christ and they were in Rome. Hallelujah. So that's why there was a letter written to the church in Rome, to the Roman church. Glory to the Lord. But they were Christians. They were people who were washed by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Bendito sea el Señor, amados hermanos. Esta carta, cuando nosotros vemos, es escrita a los romanos. Bendito sea el Señor. Esos eran eh, cristianos, creyentes de aquel tiempo, cuando Pablo, que fue dirigido por el Espíritu Santo de Dios, inspirado para que él pueda escribir esta carta hacia los romanos y para que él pueda dar el consejo a la iglesia de aquel entonces pero ese consejo también nos ayuda a cada uno de nosotros hermanos, bendito sea el Señor para siempre, y él escribe esta carta para darle ese consejo y le dice las palabras que nosotros hemos leído, aleluya and so, beloved brethren when we look at this we're going to focus today on chapter 7 and about half of chapter 8. We're not going to have a look at all the scripture, brethren, because God has a lot to speak to us today. Blessed be the name of Jesus. So we're going to focus on roughly Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8, half of the chapter 8. So your homework would be to read all of chapter 7 and to read all of chapter 8, which will make more sense to you after today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amados hermanos, nosotros vamos a enfocarnos en esta tarde a estar viendo sobre lo que Dios habla en Romanos capítulo 7 y Romanos capítulo 8. Bendito sea el Señor para siempre. Eso se lo dejo como tarea, que usted lo lea durante la semana, porque después de esta palabra que el Señor nos 
nos trae le va a poder ayudar a usted a que pueda entender más bien esa porción en esos dos capítulos que van muy juntos, aleluya, bendito sea el Señor para siempre, pero el Señor nos tiene una palabra aquí en esta preciosa tarde hermanos, so what we're going to have a look at brethren is that Paul begins to speak unto his people, unto the church, and he begins to give instructions, and he speaks mainly about three laws, brethren. Get this, he mainly speaks about three laws between chapter 7 and chapter 8 in the, in the letter to the Romans. And these three laws, just to give you a bit of a breakdown, he speaks about the law of matrimony. Yeah? Matrimony is a law between, say for example, when a couple gets married, between a man and a woman, when they get married, that has a specific law, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So he speaks about that. And then he also speaks about another law, which is a law that dwells in the members. There is a specific law, and this is a spiritual one, but it's also one that produces carnal things. And this is the law that leads to, say for example, you could call it the law known as the desires of the flesh, but it is the law of sin. Then there is a third one that he speaks about, that Paul speaks of, and that is the law of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Bueno, vamos a ver, amados hermanos, que en estos dos capítulos, Pablo habla acerca de tres leyes, ¿verdad? Poniendo ojo y atención a eso. Tres leyes. Y en esas tres leyes, amados hermanos, él habla de una ley la cual se refiere a ley del matrimonio. Entre hombre y mujer hay una ley cuando hay un matrimonio. Habla acerca de eso al comenzar del capítulo 7. Después luego habla acerca de otra ley, que él dice que encuentro que hay esta otra ley, ¿verdad? Una ley que está en la carne, en los deseos de la carne, y esa ley en la ley del de pecado. Bendito sea Dios para siempre. Pero después habla de otra ley, la tercera parte o la tercera ley, él habla acerca de la ley del Espíritu. Bendito sea el Señor para siempre. Vamos a estar viendo sobre eso en esta preciosa tarde. Gloria al Señor. ¿Cuántos pueden decir amén? Aleluya. Bendito sea el Señor. Blessed be the name of the Lord, brethren. So, what we're going to have a look at here, when you look at Romans chapter 7, verse 1 to 3, we won't go to it yet, but when you look at Romans chapter 7, verse 1 and 3, Paul starts speaking about a matrimony. Now, he starts talking about a matrimony. When a man and a woman get together in a mutual agreement, it is because they have decided to live in love and marriage. Glory be to the name of Jesus. But when somebody commits to a matrimony, they are committing to a life decision. Let me say that again. It is a life decision. There is no such thing as a divorce in Christ Jesus. There is no such thing as a divorce in a Christian life. That does not exist for Christians. So, when he is speaking about the matrimony, he's basically saying that as two people get together and as two people make an agreement before God to get married because it is God who established matrimony. It was never mankind who established matrimony. It is God who established matrimony when he created the first man and the first woman on earth. And therefore, Paul takes this example and he says, just like there is a law, When someone gets married, the law that exists is, till death do they part. That is the law. Praise the Lord. And where does that law come from? That law came from God. He was the one who established the law from the beginning of matrimony. Hallelujah. So when he starts talking about the matrimony, he says that as long as these two are alive, this matrimony are living, When they have done wedlock and they've been married, they are to, to be together, you could say, in marriage for life. Hallelujah. And if one of them dies, passes away, that is the only thing, brethren, that will sever that matrimony. That's the only thing that will cut that person from being free from that law. As long as the two of them are alive, they are bound to that law established by God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Because these things aren't really that taught in these days. But still, there's a purpose why Paul was mentioning that law. And we still have that law in the world today. At least all God-fearing Christians abide by the law of God. Hallelujah. So, when we're talking about this law, he wants to bring us 
to this example that in a matrimony it is governed by that law and we are bound by that law as long as we live. But if one of those people die, then the other person, so if the man dies, then the wife is now free from that law. She then can marry whomever she wants in the Lord, but then she is free to do so because that is the law that God gave. If the wife passes away first, then the husband, he, the man, is now free from that law. And when he chooses to marry someone else in the Lord, of course, then that is free for him to do that. This is what God has ordained in the matrimony. Hallelujah. So, lo que Dios hace, amados hermanos, a través de estos ejemplos, primeramente se menciona esta primera ley, la ley del matrimonio. Esa usted la puede encontrar ahí en Romanos capítulo 7, versículo 1 al 3. Y cuando usted ve que Pablo está hablando de esta primera ley, está hablando un ejemplo, ¿verdad? Por lo que después va a traer a nuestro conocimiento. Y él está hablando de un matrimonio entre hombre y mujer. Y cuando ese matrimonio, ¿verdad? Se, se, se casan estos dos, este hombre y mujer, pues ellos están ahora gobernados por esa ley. ¿Quién puso esa ley? Dios puso esa ley. ¿Por qué es esa ley puesta así? Porque Dios fue el que estableció el matrimonio primero. Él creó el matrimonio cuando Él estableció la vida a Adán y a Eva, los primeros hombres y mujeres en esta tierra, y, les, y los casó y a ellos les dio esa ley. Bendito sea el Señor. ¿Y qué pasa con esa ley? Esa ley pues dice que hasta la muerte se separa. ¿Eso qué quiere decir? Que si el hombre está en vida y la mujer está en vida, pues por todo el tiempo que están en vida, esa ley está vigente. No pueden quebrar con esa ley. ¿Pero qué pasa? Que si la mujer se muere, pues el hombre queda libre de esa ley. Puede después casarse con quien él quiere, siendo en el Señor. Asimismo, cuando el hombre se muere primero, pues la mujer puede casarse con quien ella quiere, pero siendo en el Señor. Ya ella sería libre de esa ley del matrimonio. Aleluya. Gloria al Señor. Pues ya que hemos visto eso, esa es una de las primeras leyes que Pablo usa para traernos a lo que él está hablando en esta porción que vamos a ver. So now that we've talked about that first law, brethren, which is just the example that Paul brings or uses for us to be able to uh, enter into understanding, brethren, just like that, he gives us to understand something very important. There is a second law that we need to be aware of. And this is something that Paul speaks about. Now, this second law is called the law of sin. Now, this law is something that dwells in our members. When I say our members, better yet to explain it even better, it is a law that is dwelling inside our blood. Our human blood that passes down from our fathers. That's why people look like their parents. That's why people have certain attitudes. That's why people have certain behaviors. That's why people act the same as their parents and uh, or like their uncles because in their blood is passed down to the next generation. The sinful things from Adam have passed down all the way through. But I want to mention this, that when we're talking about the sin, the, the, the law of sin, this law of sin that Paul speaks of, which is in our members, he's referring to what we call the desires of the flesh. This means that in our members, right, we have desires to do those things that go against God's will. This is why this law is called the law of sin. Let's have a look at some scripture. Vamos, let's look at some scripture here before we continue. Romans chapter 7, verse 23. Ahora, esta ley que nosotros vamos a ver, la segunda ley, se llama la ley del pecado. ¿La ley del pecado cuál es? Es una ley que Pablo describe que está en nuestros miembros. Es una ley que, mejor dicha, está en la sangre humana, que es tras, traspasada de generación en generación. Por eso es que usted y yo nos vemos como alguien en nuestra familia. Tenemos ciertos característicos, tenemos ciertos atributos y todo eso que viene, ¿de dónde viene? De nuestros padres que nos engendraron. Bendito sea el Señor. Pero que se ha pasado también, se ha pasado a través de la sangre, esa, digamos, deseos pecaminosos, concupiscencias, todo eso se ha pasado también. Gloria sea el Señor. 
Vamos a ver Romanos capítulo 7, versículo 23. Y esto es lo que se llaman los deseos de la carne, hermanos. Es una ley que está allí mientras usted está y yo estoy en este cuerpo de carne y sangre. Bendito sea el Señor. Now, this law, brethren, is a law that is also with us for life. It is there with us for life. As long as you have this human body, that have the blood that you've got in you, you, we have this law, which is a law of sin. It is the desires of the flesh that want to do things that are contrary to the word of God. Let's look at this scripture, which talks about it. Paul says, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So what he's saying is we can be thinking one thing, but then there's these desires that come up and it's almost like they want to take control through our emotions. They want to take control of our mind as well in the sense of, you know, we might not want to be thinking of those things, but then sometimes we have thoughts that are not pleasant to God, which want to pop in there more and more and more. This is what this is talking about. That's what Paul is saying in this verse. He says, I see that there's this law that, you know, it's in my members and it's warring. There's a war in there. You know, he's trying to do what's good. But at the same time, there's this other thing that tries to pull him the other way as well. Now, I want to explain this as well, because it says it's bringing him into the captivity to the law of sin, which is in his members. Now, I want to explain something very important to you. When Paul was writing this to the church of Romans, he's not writing this because he's telling everybody, hey, look, you know, uh, I'm a Christian, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm an apostle called by the Lord, but yet I'm still going and I'm practicing sin. And yet I'm still falling into sin because, hey, this law that's in my members is causing me to fall into sin. So I'm serving God, but then I'm still sinning. He's not talking about that. So I want to clear this up for you. What he's actually trying to point out here he's basically pointing out that a person a person any person who is living in the flesh without the spirit of christ is going to be experiencing that in their life constantly that is the battle that goes on in their mind people think about doing good things but they war against the desires of the flesh all the time so this is what paul is explaining He's explaining it in the sense of in a personal matter, but not that he's actually living that, not that he's actually going through that. He's actually explaining it in a way where he's actually saying, well, he's using himself as an example and saying, the carnal man is like this. The carnal man is going this way. The carnal man thinks like this. Hallelujah. But then we're going to see how he speaks about the spiritual man. Glory to the Lord. La palabra del Señor nos dice, y pero veo otra ley en mis miembros. Mire, dice que se revela contra la ley de mi mente y que me lleva cautivo a la ley del pecado que está en mis miembros. Mire qué cosa. Ahora, Pablo, quiero especificar, cuando el apóstol Pablo escribió esto, él no estaba pecando, sino que él no estaba escribiendo esto por, por, por decirle a todos, mire, soy llamado por Dios, soy lleno del Espíritu Santo, Dios está haciendo todos estos milagros a través de mi vida, soy llamado a ser un apóstol, pero todavía yo estoy cayendo en pecados, estoy ¿verdad? levantándome, estoy como cristiano, después estoy cayendo, no. Pablo estaba escribiendo esto para darnos a entender a nosotros cómo es estas tres leyes y cómo trabajan estas tres leyes. Él estaba poniéndose a sí mismo como por decir un ejemplo de lo que es el Pablo en la carne y el Pablo en el Espíritu. Bendito sea el Señor para siempre, para que nosotros podamos entender, hermano, porque hay gente que verdaderamente agarra estos padres y dice, ya ve, Pablo también pecaba, así que yo pues, también le doy a los deseos de la carne también, porque después Pablo también dice, pero de mí en el Espíritu. No, hermanos, eso es ser tibio. Eso es lo que la Biblia llama tibio. Y eso por eso tenía que explicar esa parte. Pero que hay una ley en los miembros, ¿verdad? En esa sangre que corre a través de todo nuestro ser, hay una ley que también quiere llevarnos cautivo a la ley del pecado. Y eso es la guerra interna. Bendito sea el Señor. Esto es lo que pasa con todo aquel y aquella 
que está, se puede decir, en este cuerpo humano que no está en el espíritu, que no tiene a Cristo en su corazón. Están ellos guerreando entre su mente, porque acuérdese que tenemos una conciencia y en esa conciencia nos dicta aquellas cosas que son buenas, aquellas cosas que son malas, pero a la misma vez como que aquellos deseos en la carne quieren guerrear y hacer aquellas cosas y llevarnos a hacer aquellas cosas en cautividad para ir a pecar, para ir a hacer las cosas en contra de nuestro Dios, pero nuestra mente siempre está diciendo no, pero eso está malo. ¿verdad? esa es la guerra constante que está en una vida que está así gloria sea el Señor but now brethren let's look at the law of the spirit hallelujah there is another law called the law of the spirit ahora vamos a ver la ley del espíritu porque hay otra ley que se llama la ley del espíritu aleluya let's turn to Romans chapter 8 verse 2 vamos a ir a Romanos capítulo 8 versículo 2 Because this is what Paul is trying to lead us to, to understand these things that work in every single one of us on a daily basis. Hallelujah. And he says, for the law of the spirit is life in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Get that. So he's not, he's not bouncing between sinning and being in the spirit. He's giving us an example saying, this is this law of matrimony. The law of, of sin is this one, which brings people bound into sin, brings them into death. But then there is a law, which is the law of the Spirit. As of the Holy Spirit of God. And he says, the law of spirit and life in Christ Jesus, because there is life in no other, he says, has made me free. Free from what? Free to do whatever I please? No. He's made me free from the law of sin and death. He's made me free from yielding, from obeying those desires of the flesh, those thoughts that want to overcome me to do those things that are sinful against God. This is the mighty power of the Holy Spirit that frees us and sets us free from sin. Glory to the name of Jesus. La palabra nos dice a nosotros, hermanos, que la ley del Espíritu de vida en Cristo Jesús, porque no hay vida en nadie más, en Cristo Jesús, esa ley me ha librado de la ley del pecado y de la muerte, porque la paga del pecado es muerte. Bendito sea el Señor. Mas la dádiva del Señor es paz y vida eterna. Aleluya. Pero ¿qué pasa, amados hermanos? Esos ese, esa ley del pecado es aquellos deseos carnales que lo quieren llevar a uno a pecar en contra del Señor. Aquellos deseos de que el que no tiene el Espíritu, aquel que no busca, aquel que, no, aquel que se descuida de las cosas del Espíritu, empieza a surgir esas cosas de, de la carne. Y eso es lo que Pablo, y eso es por qué Pablo estaba usándose a sí mismo también. Porque si Pablo, como nosotros, se viera descuidado, también hubiera estado surgiendo los deseos de la carne, hubiera estado haciendo las cosas en la carne. Bendito sea el Señor. Pero por eso él pudo explicar estas partes en esta forma. Aleluya. Gloria al Señor. Pues ya que hemos visto eso, voy a ir a explicar lo demás. But now that we've seen this, brethren, that there are these three laws that exist. Now let's look at the next part. Now we're going to see the man who lives in the flesh. The person who lives according to the desires of the flesh. And then we will see the person who lives according to the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Primeramente, amados hermanos, ahora vamos a ver el hombre que vive acerca o conforme a los deseos de la carne. Que vive según la carne. Porque también después vamos a ver el que vive según el Espíritu. Gloria sea el Señor para siempre. Vamos a leerlo aquí. Y le quiero hacer saber esto yéndonos de Romanos capítulo 7 versículo 14 vamos a comenzar de ahí now beloved brethren let's look from Romans chapter 7 verse 14 onwards what I'm going to explain here beloved brethren is this is a person who lives in the desires of the flesh now let me tell you something uh, in this that we're going to read we're going to see that Paul is explaining what a carnal man does when I say a carnal man I'm talking about a person who gives themselves over to the desires of the flesh. Now, not that Paul was giving himself to the desires of the flesh, not that Paul was living according to the desires of the flesh, no, but had lived, but people who had lived this way. Paul knew what he was talking about because remember what Paul used to do? 
before he was converted to Christ, he would persecute the church of Christ. He would basically be doing things that were of the flesh. But yet, as far as he was concerned, he was not doing things of the flesh. So, we're going to have a look into this, beloved brethren. Glory to the name of Jesus. Vamos a leer. Praise the Lord. When we look at the scripture, it says here, we're going to read from verse 14 to 24. This is Paul writing this. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. So he's saying, the things that I do, I don't agree with what I do. How many have done that before in their life? You might do something. That's an action that you take, that I take. But then we, in our mind, we're like, but I don't agree with what I just did. I know what I did was wrong. That's the conscious speaking to our mind. But then why did we do it? Why did we allow ourselves to be taken by that? Paul continues to explain. He says in verse 15, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, in other words, for what my mind says, Hey, do that. That is good. He says, that do I not. So he doesn't do what his mind is saying to do. But what I hate, that I do. Now what did Paul, what would Paul hate? Paul would hate the sin. So we can see that there's a battle going on inside. A battle between the desires of the flesh and a battle between the spirit. A battle between the desires of the flesh and a battle between our mind. Between that which is good and which is evil. And this is why many times in that battle that we go through, in decision making, and we have to make decisions every day, there are things that we do, but our mind does not agree with it. Why does our mind not agree with it? Because it also recognizes that in our conscience, the Word of God that is speaking there says, this is not right. And so therefore, we agree and we say, that is not right that I did. But yet I did it. But I hate what I did. This is what he's talking about. Now, when we look at verse 16, he says, If then I do that which I do not want to do, then I also consent unto the law, that is the law of God, that his law is good. Because his law is in my conscience and in my mind. He's saying, this is wrong. And I can agree and say, yes, what I did is wrong. So then I am agreeing that the word of God is right. That it is true. That it is just. Glory to the Lord. And we all go through this in our life, brethren. For those who know the word of God and for those who do not know the word of God. Because the word of God, which is truth, will always speak in our conscience. Hallelujah. And so therefore, Paul continues to say in verse 17, he says, Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Do we understand this? Let me just explain this a little bit. He's saying, so then, I'm realizing that if my mind is not in agreement with these things that are being done, that it's no longer me who's doing this. At least not my mind, because I'm not in agreement with that. But it is the desires of the flesh that are leading me to do this. This is why he then goes to say, but sin that dwells in me, sin that dwells in his members is what, it was what causes those actions to come out. And then when we look at verse 18, he says, for I know that in me, that is in my desires of the flesh, in that law that is within me, dwells no good thing. There's nothing good there. Because everything that it wants to do is it goes against God. It goes against what is holy. It goes against what is good. So there's nothing good in the desires of the flesh. Paul is recognizing and saying this. But then he also says, For to will, to want to do what is good, I want to will what is good. It's present. I know that I want to do what's good. But then he says, but how can I perform that which is good? I can't find the way to do that. For the good that I want to do, I don't do it. But the evil which I don't want to do, I find myself doing that. Now, 
if I do what I don't want to do, it's no more I who do it, but the sin that dwells inside me. Very important to understand this, brother. Now, then why are we punished when we do what we don't want to do? Why is it that when people, when people murder someone, and they have to give an account to the judge, and they say, oh, I didn't want to kill that person, then why did you kill that person? I heard a voice that told me to kill that person. Well, why did they listen to that voice? Why did they give in to the desires of the flesh to do that which is evil? The judge still says, well, you killed the person, so you go to jail. We can't say, but it was the devil who did it. But it was the desires of the flesh who led me to do it. I didn't want to do it. The judgment comes to the person who gives themselves to the desires of the flesh. This is why in Jesus Christ, he has given us to know that there is a law in the spirit that makes us free from the law of sin and death. But Paul is not saying all this because he was practicing these sinful things. No, Paul is giving us an example of a life that is without Christ. A life that has left the ways of God. A life that is no longer living according to the Spirit. Praise the Lord. And then we continue in verse 21. He continues to say, I find then that there is a law that when I would do what is good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God. You know, the law of God is just. He goes, I delight in the law of God after the inner man. You know, the inner man, the inner you, is the spirit that is in you. The spirit that dwells inside of us. That is the spirit, the human spirit. It connects with God. And he says in verse 22, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members and warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And then he says to himself in verse 24, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of this death? Who can help us? Who? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'll read it in Spanish and I'll continue, brethren. Vamos a leerlo en español, amados hermanos, porque mire, Pablo nos está dando a conocer que esta ley, que es tan tremenda, amados hermanos, que solo se puede conquistar con el poder de Dios. No hay otra forma. No hay otro poder. No hay otra manera para poder vencer. Dice la palabra del Señor, porque sabemos que la ley es espiritual. Esa es la ley de Dios. Mas yo soy carnal. Vendido al pecado, refiriéndose a un hombre dado al pecado. No, no, no hablándose de Pablo de lo que él estaba haciendo, sino que a un hombre dado al pecado. Un hombre carnal. Dice la, la palabra, dice, porque lo que hago no lo entiendo, pues no hago lo que quiero, sino lo que aborrezco. Eso hago. Eso quiere decir que hay una guerra interna que está él luchando. ¿Ya? Y después dice, y si lo que no quiero, esto hago, apruebo que la ley es buena. En otras palabras, cuando uno está razonando dentro de uno, la conciencia le está diciendo, aquello que hiciste está mal, ¿verdad? Pero ya lo hicimos. Nosotros hicimos algo que ofendió a Dios. Hicimos algo que fue contra la palabra de Dios. Y eso lo hicimos porque nos dimos a los deseos carnales. ¿Y por qué nos dimos a los deseos carnales? Pero a la misma vez, nuestra mente está diciendo, hice mal. Estamos, ¿verdad? También estamos en acuerdo con la voz de la conciencia que nos dice, mira, hiciste mal, aquello que hiciste está mal ante el Señor, es pecado. Y nosotros decimos, sí, es pecado, he hecho mal. Así que estamos nosotros de acuerdo que la palabra de Dios es perfecta, que la ley de Dios es buena, es justa. De manera que ya no soy yo quien hace aquello, sino el pecado que mora en mí. Ahora, lo que quiero explicar aquí es que 
aquí nadie se puede salvar y decir, ah, pues porque con todo el pecado que yo hago, le voy a echar la culpa al diablo, le voy a echar la culpa a los deseos de la carne, yo me libro de esta. No, amados hermanos, el asesino que mató a alguien que se dio a los deseos carnales y se hizo un asesino, cuando va ante el juez y el juez le dice, ¿por qué tú mataste a esta persona? Él no puede aquí desquitarse con decir, ah, es que escuché una voz que me dijo que mate, así que fui a matar. Se dio al pecado, tiene que pagar la consecuencia. Eso es así. Dice, yo sé que en mí, esto es en mi carne, los deseos carnales, no mora el bien. ¿verdad? No mora nada bien ahí. Todo es anticristo, contrario a la palabra de Dios. Dice, porque el que quiere, porque el querer, ¿verdad? la voluntad de uno, el querer, el bien está en mí. Yo quiero hacer lo que está bueno. Mi mente dice que eso es bueno. Mi mente y mi conciencia me dice que aquello está bueno. Pero no. Pero dice, mora, no, no mora nada el bien. Porque el querer, el bien está en mí. Pero no el hacerlo. Así que no lo viene a hacer. Quiere hacer aquello, pero no lo hace. Porque no hago el bien que quiero, sino el mal que no quiero. Eso hago. Y esta es de una vida, una vida, hermanos, que no está caminando con el Señor. Así está el mundo, en muchas formas así. Así está aquella persona que está descuidado de la, de la, de la, de la, del Espíritu de Dios en su vida. Y dice, y si hago lo que no quiero, ya no lo hago yo, sino el pecado que mora en mí. Eso quiere decir que esa persona está luchando hacia adentro. No está de acuerdo con lo que está haciendo, pero se cede a hacer aquellos deseos carnales en su vida que van en contra de la palabra de Dios. Solo lo llevan al pecado. Así que, queriendo yo hacer el bien, hallo esta ley, que el mal está en mí. Porque según el hombre interior, es decir, en nuestro espíritu humano, según el hombre interior, me deleito en la ley de Dios. ¿Y por qué nos deleitamos en la ley de Dios? Nos deleitamos porque sabemos que esa es la verdad. Sabemos que ese es el camino. Sabemos que ese es, ahí está nuestra sanidad. Ahí está nuestra liberación. Ahí está la vida eterna. Pero veo otra ley, mis miembros. Sé que se revela contra la ley de mi mente. Hay una lucha tremenda. Y que me lleva cautivo, miren, a la ley del pecado. La persona que se deja llevar. Mejor dicho, el cristiano que se deja llevar, porque el mundo, ellos se dejan llevar. Pero el cristiano que se deje llevar, ya es un descuido en las cosas de Dios. Porque ya dice que esta ley del pecado que está en los miembros, ¿verdad? Lo lleva cautivo, y eso no lo lleva a hacer el bien, lo lleva solo a pecar, a hacer el mal. Pero ahora vamos a ver el versículo 4, dice, miserable de mí, miren miserable de mí, ¿quién me librará de este cuerpo de muerte? ¿Quién? Gloria sea al Señor. Who can free us from the law of sin? Now I want to talk about the law of the Spirit, brethren. I want to talk about what Jesus came to do for our lives. Quiero hablarle ahora lo que Jesús vino a hacer para nosotros hermanos when we look at Romans chapter 7 verse 25 cuando vemos Romanos 7 25 we see Paul who starts to now direct us to the law of the spirit and where does he point to? he points to Jesus Christ he has brought the law of the spirit hallelujah vemos ahora a Pablo que nos apunta a la respuesta que la única respuesta que hay es en Jesucristo. Bendito sea el Señor. Es en la ley del de Espíritu. Bendito sea el Señor. The word says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with, my, with the flesh, the law of sin. So he recognizes that there are these two laws. And he's saying, With my mind, I recognize that the law of God is good. 
but with the desires of my flesh it pulls towards the desires of the flesh to the sin él dice en su palabra aquí dice dice la palabra del señor gracias doy a dios porque jesucristo señor nuestro así que yo mismo con la mente sirvo a la ley de dios reconozco que la ley de dios buena perfecta agradable más con la carne a la ley del pecado así está el mundo entero hermanos así está el mundo entero así está el cristiano descuidado de las cosas de dios cuando no se vive plenamente en el espíritu de dios this is the way brethren that the world lives their life with that constant battle warring in their mind and in the desires of the flesh the battle between good and evil wins within themselves But he points to the answer and he says, Jesus is the answer. Hallelujah. Now let's look at when it turns into chapter 8. This is where he speaks now in more depth about the law of the Spirit. Pero ahora cuando nosotros vemos en Romanos capítulo 8, ahora habla a más profundidad esa ley del Espíritu. Let's look at what happens now. And I stand on this side to represent the law of the Spirit. That was the law of the flesh. This is now the law of the Spirit. And Paul now says, this is the law in which Paul had found, the law in which he had lived his life, the law that he professed, the law that he upheld and he died for. This is the law. He says, there is now no condemn, there is therefore no, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You see, we've got to be in Christ Jesus. We've got to be in the law of the Spirit. He says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That is the only way out. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now verse 2, he says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. That is a great victory, beloved brethren. That is a great victory. You know, when people are living in this law of sin and death, This is why people are addicted to drugs. This is why people sin and they cannot let go of sin. This is why there's pedophiles. This is why there's so much corruption and darkness in the world. Because people are living in the law of sin. People are battling. They yield. They give themselves in. And who can set them free? The law of the Spirit. Hallelujah. In verse 3 it says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, In other words, when I'm battling with the law of my mind, I'm battling with my strength. I'm saying, no, this is not right. I'm not going to do this. But eventually we do things in our life that are not pleasing to God. And then we're going, oh, I did this thing that's wrong. And I've got it in my conscience. Now my consciousness is, is tainted with sin because I fell into it. I gave into it. But he is saying here, What that law of my mind could not do because it was weak, because I was relying on my strength against the desires of the flesh. He now says, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Get this. Jesus being the Christ, holy for eternity, was up in heaven. He came down to earth and took on board a body of flesh and blood. Having desires of flesh, but not giving in to any of them, therefore no sin was found in him. That is why death could not hold him down. Because the sting of sin is death. But it says, he, his own son, God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh and because the sin that was in the flesh the body that he had had to be crucified had to be killed because he came someone without sin to die for all humanity who was under the power of sin hallelujah praise the lord and then in romans uh, verse 4 it says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit hallelujah praise the lord mire que preciosa la palabra amados hermanos 
cuando nosotros vemos este ejemplo en el versículo 1 en adelante, dice el Señor a nuestra vida, ahora pues, ninguna condenación hay, esta es la ley del Espíritu, mire la diferencia, ahora pues, ninguna condenación hay para los que están en Cristo Jesús es que hay que estar en Cristo Jesús hermano esto no es de estar de tibio esto no es de que si quiero, esto no es de mañana es de cada día en el Señor y dice la palabra para que los que están en Cristo Jesús lo que no andan conforme a la carne sino conforme al Espíritu ahí no hay condenación porque la ley del Espíritu de vida en Cristo Jesús me ha librado de la ley del pecado y de la muerte, es decir ya no cedemos al pecado ya no nos damos a ceder a esas cosas Bendito sea el Señor para siempre, porque lo que era imposible para la ley, por cuanto era débil por la carne, es decir, cuando la ley, ¿verdad? Acuérdese que hay una ley en la mente, y nosotros, cada uno, cada persona lucha en su propia mente y dice, no, aquello es pecado, yo no voy a hacer aquello, pero sin el poder del Espíritu, sin Cristo Jesús, vamos a hacer eso. Eso es lo que dice, la ley de la mente es débil, porque nosotros tenemos que descansar, nosotros somos débiles, no podemos estar luchando contra algo que está constantemente luchando ahí, queriendo llevarnos a pecar, así está el mundo entero, pero porque eso era débil, tuvo que Jesús venir para darnos una limpieza de conciencia que no la podíamos obtener de otra forma, porque lo que era imposible para la ley, por cuanto era débil por la carne, Dios enviando a su Hijo en semejanza de carne, de pecado, y a causa del pecado, condenó al pecado en la carne. Tuvo que morir en Jesucristo. Él anduvo en un, un cuerpo de, de carne y sangre, pero sin pecado, sin darse a los deseos carnales. Y por lo cuanto, la muerte no lo pudo detener. Aleluya. Eso fue para salvación de toda la humanidad. Aleluya. Gloria a Dios. Y sigue la palabra diciendo, para que la justicia de la ley se cumpliese en nosotros, que no andamos conforme a la carne, sino conforme al Espíritu, a esa ley del Espíritu. Aleluya, gloria al Señor, gracias Cristo. And we can say, thank you Jesus Christ, because of the law of the Spirit that is being given to us. Aleluya. So brethren, those who are in the law of the flesh and those who are in the law of the spirit there's a very big difference because from verse 5 to verse 8 he then says for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh you see people who are in the flesh in the desires of the flesh they pay more attention to things that are of the desires of the flesh They think more of themselves instead of thinking first about the things of God. They put themselves first instead of putting God first. They put the things of themselves first instead of the things of God first. The pleasures first instead of seeking God first. This is what the word is showing us. In Romans 8 verse 5 it says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That is what's abounding in there yeah that's the main thing that's in there have you ever met people that all they do all day long is they, they're just glorifying god they talk about god they talk about jesus and wherever they look wherever they go they say oh i praise god for the clouds that i praise god for the food that he gave me today and there's people that get upset with them people when they say can't you talk about anything else other than jesus no because jesus is my everything you know he created everything so i give thanks to him because i see him in everything But the people who are carnally minded, they're not thinking about Jesus all the time. They go, oh, I think I'm going to go over there today, and I think I'll do this today. Oh, yeah, this, oh, I'm going to try this. Or, oh, no, I need to seek the Lord, and, but, you know, I'll leave it for later on. I'll see if I've got some time. There's a big difference. Now, people who don't have Christ at all, they don't even want to think about God. People who have nothing about Christ in them or flowing through them, they don't want to think about God at all. But it says in the scripture that we've read, they mind the things of the flesh, but they are that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Think about it. What's on your mind on a daily basis? What's on my mind on a daily basis? Where do we spend our mind? Where does it go? 
verse 6, versículo 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Why is it life and peace? Because the conscience is at peace. There's nothing pointing there saying, you know, you've done wrong today, you've sinned today, and my mind is, is agreeing and saying, oh yeah, I did that wrong. And no, it's peace because it's aligned with the Spirit of God in His law. But when we're living in the carnal mind, we are not at peace. Because in our conscience, the Word of God is saying, you've done wrong. You need to repent. You need to bring it before the Lord. You can't continue to live like this. And there's a battle. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to repent today. You know, you know my heart, Lord. I'll do it tomorrow. And there's a battle against the Spirit. But that's why when people are currently minded, it is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7. Because the carnal mind, get this. The carnal mind is an enemy of God. Why is it an enemy of God? Because the carnal mind always wants to do those things that go against God's will. That's what this is saying, brethren. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject, it's not humble towards God, it does not submit to God. Doesn't? want to do the law of God and it cannot do the law of God. Look at that. It says neither indeed can be. It can't do the will of God. Can't bring itself to do the will of God. But that's the carnal in the person. It cannot yield to God. That's why it can't please God. Everything that it does is against God and it is an enemy of God. And verse 8 says so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. It's very simple. Very, very transparent. Es bien sencillo, hermano. Bien transparente. Porque el que, el que anda siempre pensando las cosas de la carne y se deja llevar por las cosas de la carne y no quiere andar en la ley del Espíritu y dejándose llevar, descuidándose de las cosas del Espíritu, se levantan los deseos de la carne, debilita eh, la ley del Espíritu dentro de uno, y en, esa, en, ese, en esos deseos, esos placeres, lo llevan a uno a pensar las cosas del mundo, a practicar las cosas de la carne, y a tener enemistad con Dios. Porque ahí leemos en este versículo, dice, y los que viven según la carne no pueden agradar a Dios. No lo pueden agradar. Eso es así, ¿no? De claro. But then verse 9 and 10, pero ahora versículo 9 y 10. Ya vamos a ir terminando. He says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be, now let's analyze ourselves. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Ask yourself the question. And I have to ask myself the question. Does the spirit of God dwell in me? Does the Spirit of God dwell in you? Is He doing a work in you? Is He doing a work in me? Because He says, because in verse 9 says, But you are not of the flesh, but of in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. It means that that, that person is not a Christian. It means that that person does not have the Holy Spirit guiding them. They are still in the flesh. And God is saying to us, if that person does not have the Spirit of God to, to move, to dwell in the law of the Spirit, he's not, 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 not of Christ. But he's also saying in verse 10, and if Christ be in you, so then if Christ is in us, and the law of Christ is in us, then it says that the body, the desires of that flesh, should be dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness hallelujah praise the lord glory to the name of jesus bendito sea el señor así que si el señor mora en nosotros la palabra nos está diciendo que si el señor mora en nosotros debemos ya de estar muertos a los deseos de la carne 
No debe existir eso en nosotros. Aleluya. Bendito sea el Señor. Verse 13 and 14. Versículo 13 y 14. For if you live. Now get this. You and I have a God given free will. You can choose. I choose. What do I want to do? Who do I want to give myself to? We have seen now that there is a law of the flesh. There is a law of the spirit. Hemos visto que hay una ley de la carne, hay una ley del espíritu. Y tenemos libre albedrío para escoger. And the scripture says, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the spirit, do kill, mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. You see, he's telling us that the only way to overcome the desires of the flesh is to dwell daily in the spirit. The law of the Spirit. La palabra nos está diciendo claro de que la única forma que podemos vencer la ley de la carne para no darnos a ella es permanecer en la ley del Espíritu. No hay de otra. And then in verse 14 he says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Hallelujah. Los que son guiados por el Espíritu, también, amados hermanos, esos son los que tienen a Dios. Esos son los que son llamados hijos de Dios. Now, what are some evidences of someone being in the Spirit? You ever read about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians? But the fruit of the Spirit, those are the evidences that the Spirit is guiding, leading that person. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Patience, goodness, kindness, faith, Hallelujah. humbleness, self-control. These are the things that you will see evident in a person and growing daily in them. When you see someone who is stuck and they are no longer growing in the fruit of the Spirit, they are stuck. But people cannot stay stuck for long. Because either we are in the Spirit who makes us grow in the Spirit, or either we're in the flesh and we grow in the flesh. Either the Spirit gets stronger, or the flesh gets stronger. So someone who is stuck in the, in the, in, in the growth will start to go down, will start to go backwards. The flesh will start to come out. And what are the works of the flesh? There are many. Adultery, fornication, witchcraft, lying, cheating, fighting, cursing. All of these things are desires of the flesh, people who give themselves to them. So, beloved brethren, I'll finish with this verse. Galatians 5.24 Voy a terminar con esto. Galatas 5.24 And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Los que son de Cristo, pero los que son de Cristo han crucificado la carne con sus pasiones y deseos. Aleluya. We come to an end of this sermon, brethren. Terminamos este sermón. Pero les quiero hacer saber que el que quiera oración, podemos orar. El que quiera arrepentirse de cualquier cosa, Usted puede levantar su mano y oramos por todos. If you would like to repent of something today, brethren, the invitation is open. If you would like to put aside the desires of the flesh and have the Holy Spirit lead you in the fruits of the Spirit, you can decide that today. You can raise your hand wherever you are and you can say, I'm on prayer. We're going to do a prayer right now for each who have that intention in the heart. Let's be standing, brethren. We're going to come into words of prayer. Vamos a ponernos de pie, hermano. Vamos a orar. Dios nos ha dado esta palabra porque Él nos habla claro a cada uno de nosotros. God gives us this word because He speaks to us very clearly to each of us. All of us go through this battle of good and evil in our life. Every single person. Todos vamos por esta batalla en nuestra vida del bien y el mal. Pero solo hay un camino para 
There is only one way out to go and get to the end, and that is in the law of the Spirit of Christ. Hallelujah.